First of all, let me start by saying that's a very hard act to follow. <laughs> Number two, um, having been an employee of the University of California system for 17 years, I'm so glad Jagdeep is managing my pension and, <laughs> and putting it to right use. And you'll hear from him and you'll agree with me. So let me, I thought I'll just put a context to, the, um, to this uh, discussion. And I'm going to talk about innovation because that's the bread and butter of the United States. If you look back at the 20th century and look at all the innovations that have happened starting from airplanes to electricity to space applications to polio vaccination to the internet and the transistors and lasers all in between, that all happened in the United States and really enabled the rest of the world. And I think that, that's why we call the 20th century the American century. But it's in a global context. That's very important. And I think as we're facing the challenges of not just the climate change, but access to energy as well, we got to think of it in a bold, dynamic way. So I'm going to just set the agenda and or at least a framework for the discussion. Um, so this is, so let's go back in history and see where we are. We're talking, I think Jennifer was talking about um, you know, jobs, and that's really about the growth of our economy, the GDP growth, which is a good thing. Our population is also growing. In fact, we are going to be about, we are seven point something billion now, globally. We're going to be about 10 billion by the end of this century with an uncertainty of 10 billion. So we really don't know exactly. The, the economy is very well correlated, the growth, with energy use. Without the energy, you just can't grow the economy. And as we know, it's been, for the last 250 years, mostly about fossil energy. And as a result, the greenhouse gas emissions, the CO2 emissions are going up. And these are called the global exponentials. And what we're trying to do is to turn that around we like the, the GDP growth per capita to be exponentially growing. We like that. But we don't like the other exponential growth is the CO2 concentration, which is also growing exponentially. So the big question, if you step back for a moment, the big global question is how do we decarbonize our energy system and continue economic growth? If you could figure this out, and that's really the global challenge, and the United States should be leading that in the world. Number two, and this is a bit of a misnomer. I would say it's, it's a little timid. Climate change is happening now. Climate change is accelerating. And if you look at this latest study on sea level rise, the sea level rise is accelerating. And I put the numbers out there. I don't call it good, bad, and ugly. No, it's bad, worse, and ugly. And that's the level of sea, sea level rise that's going to happen by the end of the century. And in between, in our lifetime, we're going to see this happen. And if you think that Superstorm Sandy had a, had a you know, really adverse effect, it's going to be even more in the future. And that kind of sea level rise, if you know, the 10% of the population is along the seacoast. So this is a big, big deal. And this is just one issue. You heard about the, disease, the tropical disease, the drought, all of this is an issue. So, I think while we are trying to decarbonize the energy system and while continuing economic growth, we got to think about how do we adapt to climate change because it is already happening. That's number two. Number three, talking about the global context, and we have a role to play in this one, is that we have about one and a half billion people who do not have access to electricity and enough energy. And so the big question that we have also is how can we enable access to affordable energy for economic development for billions of people? And frankly, our economic growth is tied to that as well, because if they once they increase the human development index and the, their GDP growth, that's tied to our GDP growth. And so these are the three big issues. And I would say we need to go back to our bread and butter on innovation. And this is innovation not just in technology writ large. So I'm going to invoke a great American philosopher who seemed to have retired. I don't know why. Uh, in these, these times, he would be, I think, very instrumental. Um, and talk about 
and this is not, as we know, not one technology, but it's not 100, so I'll just pick a number of 10. So this great American philosopher is David Letterman. And, you know, he has always came up with this top 10 list. So if you were to think a little longer term and ask the question, what are those game-changing innovations that could happen? And I'm talking about technology. I'll talk about the financial and the market, et cetera, as well. What would they be? Now, I'm not going to talk about all 10, but I'm going to use that as a way to frame the discussion. There are 10 of them. I'll, the, everyone should have the pet 10. These are mine. This about carbon capture at very low cost, photovoltaic systems that are ultra cheap, electricity storage, nuclear energy, building energy efficiency, energy efficiency writ large, uh, using carbon dioxide, turning carbon dioxide into oil. If you could do that in a renewable way, wouldn't that be fantastic at $2 a gallon? I'm not going to go deeper. I mean, if, if I were to, as a scientist and engineer, if I were to go deeper, this will take a, a lot of time. But I'm going to pick storage. If we could figure out, because this cuts across all those three big questions, if we could figure out how to make electricity storage at less than $100 a kilowatt hour, it will change the ball game not only for decarbonizing the, our electricity grid, but also addressing resilience in our electricity system, as well as enabling a lot of people around the world to have access to electricity uh, in a very meaningful way. So I'm just going to pick one. And even at this, I know that a lot of people know about the whole energy innovation uh, process, the journey that, it, that someone takes. But I know it may be redundant to some, but, I, but even at the sake of redundancy, I just want to put it out there because I want to show you that there are some gaps in our ecosystem that needs to be filled, and I hope the next administration really takes this upon themselves to fill them. So this is a busy curve, busy graph plot, and I'm going to walk you through this. Any technology has to scale. If it does not scale in the energy business, it doesn't matter. And if you look at, you know, if plot cost over performance as one, and scale at the other, all technologies fall with some learning curves. And along that y-axis is risk. And that's where capital investment has to consider that as well. So today, if you take any technology, let's say lithium-ion batteries or today's air conditioners, whatever may, may that may be, it has a learning curve. That is, the more you do, the cost comes down. And this is based on research. This is based on various cost of capital reduction, all kinds of things. The cost slowly comes down. And so this is current technology. There's also the technology which will be disruptive. And we'd rather have the disruption come from within the United States than coming from the outside. And these are new technologies, and the goal of the new technologies is not to be just a new technology, it's to reduce cost so that it becomes more affordable and is better performance, providing new services that has to happen in the long term. And of course, when you take on these new technologies, these, you know, this is risky business. This is where the government comes in. This is where organizations like ARPA-E were funded. And this funding goes to places like Stanford and Berkeley and MIT and many other places. This is where the research is going on. So if, let's say, someone out here in a lab in McCullough in a building comes up with a way to make an aluminum air battery. I'm just taking this because this battery, the energy density is as much as hydrocarbons, in fact, slightly larger. If someone can figure this out, what is the journey it will take? So this is a lot of research is going on, and you've got to take multiple shots at goal to have a portfolio approach, and these crosses are ideas that just don't work out. I call them opportunities to learn and go back to the starting block again. But this is what has funded the R&D that Secretary Schultz was talking about but federal and sometimes state government, but the federal government is predominantly. So this is where what I call proof of concept and perhaps a proof of system, and that's the amount of time and dollars it takes. This is what the federal government does. This is what Department of Energy, Department of Commerce, they do. Then it's the proof of scalability, because if it doesn't scale, as I said, it doesn't matter. There's some pilot demonstration. This happens in large and small corporate labs. This is in the private sector because it's very hard to do scalability and pilot in a university. That's not the role of the university. 
Then is the question of if it really meets all the, all the standards of lowering cost and being high performance, you've got to create a supply chain. You've got to have regulatory compliance and further cost reduction. This is in the private sector. It's a large corporation, a small corporation, or a partnership of that. And I put a little cloud and I'll come back to that. And then, of course, there are products and services and market adoption and deploy what we call deployment. This is where you know, this happens in the large corporations where federal and state tax policy, whether it's investment tax or the production tax credits, the project finance, private public capital, I hope this, I know Dan Riker is going to talk about the master limited partnership, which will bring private capital uh, uh, in, in this business in clean energy. So all of that comes at that stage. And finally, then, of course, there has to be markets. And the markets have to be created by price. I prefer price and carbon. On the supply side, on the demand side, there are some market inefficiencies. Markets don't work. We need to have some things like appliance standards and all, which are on the regulatory side. But whatever it is, it is a combination of the two. Now, what is missing out here? And I think there's a big thing, and, and hope we get to talk about it, is things that are in between. And the venture capital industry is actually withdrawn from this right now, so it's very hard to move this. So post-Paris, what has happened? We have mission innovation, which is really government funding, and Secretary Moniz has done a fabulous job, not just in, in his attempt to double the budget on the energy side, on the government budget, energy R&D, in five years, He's rallied around the world to get about 20 countries to fall in line, and they're doing that right now, which is fantastic. Then we have Bill Gates and a cohort, and including the University of California system, to come in and say we have Breakthrough Energy Coalition, and I know we're going to get into that. And that is happening, and that is taking shape right now. And then the oil and gas companies, the top 10 companies, came and said we have a climate initiative. And then the question is, what are we missing? And we wrote, a few of us, myself, John Deutsch, Norm Augustine, and Secretary Schultz, we wrote an article, what is the role of the private sector? And I think in this one, we said that, well, if it's going to take a billion dollars and 10 years to take all the way from pilot to full-scale business, that's the role of the private sector. That's a lot of money, a lot of time. Maybe they could form partnerships to be able to come together to share the cost, share the risk, and share the rewards so that you actually move the needle. Let me just finish by a few other things. We need innovations in all categories. This is not just R&D in science, technology, and manufacturing, as we just heard. Finance, MLPs, MLP Parity Act is going on, and this is a tax policy. Are we going to hear about it? Institutional reform, this is a lot of work that for example, in the electricity sector, we have now this big thing going on in distributed energy resources, um, and there needs to be some reform out there, regulatory reform, business models, and new policies to align all of them. It's very important that they're not going in different directions. They actually coherently align. This is like a laser. A laser beam is much more powerful than a beam that is going in all different directions, because a laser beam is coherent. So the coherent alignment of these innovations to accelerate the transition and the speed has to be faster than climate change. That's the, that's the goal. That's the target. The government can do a lot. Of course, this R&D, this market and financial policy would love to see a price on carbon, a revenue neutral tax. And I would add a revenue neutral tax that is starting at low level and then ramping up to give a clear, predictable signal to the business community that this is going to happen so that they can take their actions in an appropriate fashion. Enabling the states, I think Jennifer talked about that, enabling the states is very important. Our whole electricity system is in the state regulatory system. There's a North American part that Secretary Schultz always talks about that is that he did not talk about today. We are blessed with Canada on the north and Mexico at the bottom, on the south of us. And Mexico has changed its constitution to enable energy, and that's enormously important, not just the oil and gas, but also the electricity sector. And this partnership in, the, in North America is really our geopolitical strength. And energy is geopolitics. And it's extremely important that we pay attention to this. And I know that Secretary Moniz is doing that right now. Convening and enabling the other nation, the United States has to play a role in the global stage to convene the other nations, and I know we have a clean energy ministerial coming up at the end of this month, 
Convening the private sector for partnership, the convening authority of the government is enormous. And to catalyze organizations like what we have done in the semiconductor business and Semitech and others, could we do that in the energy space? It's absolutely important that we do that. So again, you share the cost, share the risk, and share the rewards. Early adopter, I think Secretary Schultz talked about that. Uh, the biggest energy user, single entity, is the Department of Defense. Could we use them as an early adopter of some of the technologies in current Silicon Valley language, it's called eating your own dog food. And finally, and at least this is my experience, the role of the government is not just to fund research, but to create an ecosystem of people, of a community. If you go back in the history of DARPA, when it created internet and many other things, it's not that they just funded. They created a network of people of bringing them together, thinking, in, in, a, in a competitive way and also in a collaborative way, that ecosystem of community building is extremely important to shepherd some technology from its early stages all the way to late stages. So this is not just a handoff. This is discussion and feedback loops across all these things that are going on. It's very important that the government enables that to happen. Finally, let me end with a quote, which I think was given for reasons that we all know, but it's so appropriate for these times. And this is from Martin Luther King. We are, faced, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Thank you. I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to use schools for rivalry, but a very important decision for me every morning is what color should I wear? Uh, in a turban, and I love blue, and I love red. But if there was one message I'd give to the president is to go green. <laughs> <laughs> so I moved here two years ago from Alberta, the oil sand. It's in the news this week. Um, and one of the very first things I had to uh, deal with uh, on my desk was, what do we do with fossil fuels at the University of California? It's certainly an important question for everyone. and. Um, in trying to address a question like that, um, you sort of have to step back and say, I'm not going to make any knee-jerk reactions on what to do or try and grab any headlines, but most importantly, try and think about what is the problem we're trying to solve and how do you deal with it holistically. Uh, and the approach to do that has taken a good two years, and I would say we're still at the starting point in many ways of putting real dollars to work in real problems and real uh, solutions. But our approach at the University of California has been to think about investing in climate change solutions. And this has been a theme for us over the last two years. We've committed what I think is a significant portion of cap our capital base, our balance sheet towards this. And I'm sure we'll get the opportunity to talk later on about how we want to go about doing that. But for us, uh, the question really boiled down to this. If you take you know, the global economy and you think about the impact of fossil fuels, 10% of the global economy is energy or energy-related services. If you bring that down for us at the University of California, uh, my office manages the pension, the endowment, the working capital pools. That's about $100 billion. 10 billion of that, in some way, shape, or form, deals with energy or energy-related services. Not an easy question to answer when you're asked some of these questions by your stakeholders. So the approach we've taken is to commit a billion dollars over the next five years, investing in climate change and climate change solutions. And for us, one great example of partnerships that brings together a lot of what Arun's talked about, right from where it needs to start with the innovation that's happening at great universities like Stanford and the University of California, governments bringing them together and then funneling that pipeline of innovation and patents and R&D finally into the commercial <coughs> and private sector all the way through to scale up. And let me end with, you know, last night I had a company that I have funded while I was in Alberta in the wind farm space. New technology funded by some of the great VCs here in town. And the CEO just dropped in to say, I got a problem. Half a billion dollar valuation. We're running out of money in six months. 
the VCs who are marquee on my board have lost complete interest because their focus is somewhere else. Thank you for having brought the Kuwaitis and the Abu Dhabi and the New Zealanders and yourselves to the table. But I need to figure this out because we are this far away from getting that big contract with the big retailer. And it could really be a game changer. I'm 18 months away from being cash flow positive. But frankly, this does not seem to be the season in Silicon Valley to keep funding my idea. What can you do? Yeah. And that was last night at 7 o'clock. So sort of very appropriate coming here today. And I'm sure we'll talk about some of the ideas I discussed with him last night about how we could potentially help in something like this. Uh, and that's really what I think the Breakthrough Energy Coalition and some of these things are all about. Let me pause there, because I'm sure we'll have lots of questions. Well, let's set the stage by recognizing that over the coming decades, and certainly by the end of this century, uh, we need to have deeply decarbonized our, our energy system. And, and really that means zero emissions, or, or even better, negative emissions. Mm -hmm. and, and Arun, you have your list of, of technologies, your top 10, and, uh, and you highlighted one example, but what I'd like you to do is to think about in the, in the, the near term, the mid term, and then in the long term, you know, how do you, what, what are the most critical technologies and why and how should the government be thinking about supporting these given that they span the time scale from immediate to a long time from now? So let me just, can you hear me? Okay. First of all, I think um, if you look at the global context and including the United States, I know that we have found a lot of natural gas, which is terrific. It is decarbonizing our electricity system. Um, but we are still using coal, which is a huge source of at least 20, 25 percent of our electricity. Um, we need to decarbonize that urgently. And that's carbon capture. Uh, I think there will be at some point a price on carbon. I just can't predict exactly when. I don't think anyone can. Um, and when that price of carbon hits, this will be a, uh, you will need for technology. I think it's very important to bring down the cost of carbon capture. Today it's about $60, $70 a ton for post-combustion capture. If you could bring it down to below $30 a ton, you, then there's a lot of markets that open up as well. So that is clearly one. Um, I think energy efficiency, Secretary Schultz mentioned, absolutely critical. And this is in our buildings, in our manufacturing supply chains, um, in our transportation. Um, I think it's extremely critical that we pay a lot of attention, not just to the technology, but the behavior, as was mentioned, and Jim uh, is working on that, but also on the, uh, the regulatory reform involved in this. Uh, so I think that, and the financing, energy efficiency, you, you know, you, if you don't have the financing up front, it's extremely difficult to actually enable that. In the long term, and there are many others, we love to get nuclear um, energy, but that has to be cost competitive, and that requires some regulatory reform as well, and some technologies to come in. I think the long term, if you really are trying to look at negative emissions, um, we have to look at things like how do we do agriculture the right way, land use, as well as you know, if you could somehow figure out how to take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and turn that into hydrocarbons or some kind of storage at, uh, in a $2 a gallon, that would completely change the ballgame. And we don't know how to do that because it's too expensive to do that. It's not that we can't do it. It's just that it's too expensive and it's not viable. And those are the kinds of things that I would look at. Looking at biology, by the way, this is, we are in the golden age of biology. And we are using it for health. Um, if we could, you know, so why, what does it relate to this? I mean, if you look at photosynthesis, which is where all our food comes from, even if you're not a vegetarian, your food comes from photosynthesis. It is one of the most inefficient processes out there. If you go from sunlight, to a chemical bond, it's less than 1% efficient. Just a little bit of increase, and we had funded this from RPE, a little bit of increase in efficiency on the Calvin-Benson cycle um, can change not only the ball game for biomass use for energy, but also for food, which is going to be absolutely critical.
in the future. So I don't want to take up too much time, but there's a lot. Of okay, I'm going to ask you one more. I, yeah. I know you've done a lot of work on the electric grid, and can you say something about the importance of the transformation of our electric grid, and, and again, what is an appropriate government R&D role in that transformation? So just to give a, a, a shameless publicity, Sally and I just wrote an article, which is on the Precode Institute on decarbonizing the electricity grid. So if you look, if you step back, the grid was started, at least the architecture of the grid has not changed for the last 120 years. The architecture. This is the Tesla Edison architecture. And the paradigm is you've got centralized generation, long distance transmission, medium voltage distribution into our homes. And the generation always follows the load. And it flows one way. This paradigm is going to change because it was never meant for 50% renewables integration where there are all kind of transients in the, in the generation part. It was never meant for that. It was never meant for distributed electricity from the edges of the grid feeding back. It was meant, never meant for that. And all our institutions, whether it's the, the ISOs, the grid operators, the utilities, the regulatory system, the business model, the financial system, is all based on paradigm. So when the paradigm is changing, everything shifts. And so I think there's a role that we have to play in, in the R&D as well as the, the regulatory framework and the business models and the financing to see how can we transition is the most cost-effective way into where, let's say, California is trying to go 50% renewable by 2030. That's not easy. And this is not just in California. This is going to go around the world. And so I think there's a huge amount of the university as a non-financial stakeholder to bring not on, to not only do the R&D, but bring the communities on, for example, both sides of the meter together to really enable this to happen. Okay, terrific. So, so let's turn our attention to the Breakthrough Energy Coalition. So, of course, all of us in the research community and, and concerned citizens about climate change, we're delighted uh, to hear about this. And so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. And, and in particular, how will the Breakthrough Energy Coalition think about its investments? You know, what are those areas? So Arun had his top 10 list. So, so what do you think are the most important things to invest in? And what time frame, you know, is this short, medium, long term? How, how is the Breakthrough Energy Coalition thinking about that? And then, again, thinking about the government, what would be a government partnership or role in the, in the you know, carrying out that program? Great. Let me actually just start off with the electric grid as an example. Um, and, and thinking about that, we have trillions of dollars of capital in the world that we ascribe to what we call either sovereign wealth funds or pension funds or endowments. Um, and a, a typical thing that has been popular over the last decade or 20 years is investing in infrastructure. Uh, these are highly regulated assets. They have cash flows that provide an income stream. Uh, they have an inflation hedge in them and they tend to do better than just bonds and with some equity upside that comes from capital expenditures that you invest into the upkeep and maintenance and improving the state of this infrastructure. In fact, if you're an individual and you're retiring, those are exactly the characteristics you're looking for after you retire that you want to have in your income stream to manage your retirement income needs. So this has become fashionable. For the last 20 years, there are many pension plans and sovereign funds around the world that do this day in and day out. In fact, there's now too much supply of capital into infrastructure relative, for the, relative to the, uh, sorry, too much supply of capital, so the demand, demand is very high, but the supply of assets is very limited. So these assets are highly bid up and very competitive in an auction. So when I was in Alberta, this was exactly what we were looking to invest in, was infrastructure. But the question we asked was the question that both of you might have addressed in your paper. You just can't keep buying this kind of infrastructure. That is, the centralized grid transmission type of infrastructure. So when you think about energy, distributed energy is going to have a place in this world. And so we started thinking about what is the new kind of infrastructure that long-term investors who are patient and have that 20, 30, 40 year time horizon that matches the liabilities that we have obligations to pay out. 
And so that really was the intellectual curiosity that led me personally to start looking for new kinds of infrastructure. And as I looked for that, I ended up discovering distributed energy as an attractive area to make investments in. But the challenge you have is there's not enough of this distributed energy beyond wind and solar today that has enough of an operating history that gives you the comfort to make that investment like you do in a traditional sense today. So when you start looking for these new opportunities, you realize you have to move beyond just infrastructure to innovation. You have to get comfortable taking technology risk. You can buy a wind turbine today, but Vestas has an operating history for a very long time. You cannot find that with new kinds of innovative, disruptive energy sources. So then we started moving into the world of investing in innovation. And the intention there was we'll put a little bit of money to work in a company that's innovative and disruptive. We'll get to understand the business. And at some point, this company is going to mature to the point where it's going to require that large scale of capital. And we are best suited. And in fact, we would have an informational advantage if we were investing in the innovation ourselves. That was my experience prior to coming here. When I got to California, and I had to address the broader question of how do you reinvest in energy and the evolution of that energy mix in the portfolio of a long-term investor, one thing was pretty clear to me. There were going to be good opportunities for scaling up technologies where the risk and return profile matched that of a long-term institutional investor. You could be an endowment or a pension plan. In fact, let me, let me state for all of you a fact of life is that endowments across this country in their real assets portfolio tend to have oil and gas exploration and production. Not hundreds of millions, but billions of dollars worth of it. That's got to potentially change. You cannot keep investing in that if we think we're going to be in a cleaner energy future. So then the question became, OK, how do you fund the innovative side of it? And I could tell you, and you would all acknowledge that there are more scars than there are success stories because of many of the things that Erwin's talked about. The business models had a lot of hubris attached to them. The lack of partnerships because the VCs thought that they could do this on their own and they didn't need the bigger corporations to partner with. And frankly, government instability in the application of the support that's required to enable these companies to succeed and the onerous terms that governments would put on even the most primitive type of loan structures that needed to help these companies succeed. When you add all those things together, the last 10 to 20 years have clearly been a great lesson for a lot of people. That does not mean you stop investing in clean energy. Now, what do we do going forward? I'm at the University of California. It's a very public university. I don't have the luxury of being in a private entity. The decisions I make are going to get the scrutiny of the public. But I do feel strongly that investing in innovation can be profitable. This is our thinking until one day we got a phone call from Bill Gates. And Bill Gates said, I've got 27 of my friends together with myself. And we're going to go after this. We're going to go big, and we're going to make this happen. It was, I, there, was not, there was no need to sell me on this. I had seven years of thinking through this problem. And my only question to Bill Gates was, how can we help you? We have 10 campuses across the state. We have three Department of Energy national labs. We have five medical centers. We spend close to $1 to $2 billion a year annually on energy, traditional energy to maintain a $26 billion enterprise with 300,000 staff and 250,000 students. And we have $100 billion of capital, of which I've committed a billion. You just tell me how we can help you. And so that led to Bill Gates saying, we'd like you to be part of this ecosystem that we're creating. It's called the Breakthrough Energy Coalition. And we don't want you to bring capital, because we've got lots of that. We want you to bring everything else you just described. Because if you're going to be an LP or a limited partner in this partnership, you better be a valuable limited partnership. So what's the Breakthrough Energy Coalition? Because that's the fundamental question you asked me. It's 27 individuals and the University of California today. But that's going to grow. 
That just happened to be the effort for four to six months of getting the ball rolling. Number one. Number two, it's of course trying to get 20 countries to double their R&D budget. But I think if you can put 27 LPs with a good capital base of a couple of billion dollars together, beyond just capital, they bring a lot of value added. The one thing I said to Bill Gates is that we can definitely help with the scale-up capital because that's something I feel most comfortable with. And in fact, I feel most confident that we can get our peers around the world. It could be the Kuwaitis or the folks from the Abu Dhabi region or, or other parts of the world in Australia and New Zealand where there's an abundance of pension capital or sovereign capital and they completely understand how to invest in infrastructure. You don't have to give them a pitch on clean energy. You just have to say it's the next generation of infrastructure for the world. So we can bring that capital as well together for the scaling up. So the Breakthrough Energy Coalition is going to focus on a couple of billion dollars of investments in what I would call 100 to 200 breakthrough ideas. And the intent there is that a couple of these breakthrough ideas, someone asked me last, yesterday, I was at a forum with Arun, it was at the Tesla factory, and the question was, if you could run a magic wand, what would the next decade look like? And I said, I hope the next decade's got 10 Teslas, not one Tesla that we can be proud of. And I hope that the Breakthrough Energy Partnership is going to be learning from all the lessons of the past and try very hard to put in place something that is much better with the hope of trying to create the reality and the vision that everybody's going to talk about today and for the next president. So it's a work in progress. Everybody asks us, are you ready to go? The answer is no. We're taking the time to figure out how this needs to work. This is a long-term problem. This is a 20-year thing. Our intention is not to have an exit three years from now in an IPO or six years from now. We have to be patient, and that's where I think long-term capital, like the University of California and other universities and endowments in this country, are ideally suited, because our horizon is not impatient. And that's, I think, what it's going to take to create a cleaner and a better energy future in terms of real companies that will be part of the economy. Okay, well, terrific, thank you. Um, <clears throat> that sets up nicely, I think, the next topic. So, so Secretary Schultz you know, talked about 1973 and the first energy crisis. And at that time, there was an enormous investment in, in energy and clean energy and energy that would made us independent from having to rely on importing energy from other countries. And, and by some measures, you know, it was wildly successful. Uh, we wouldn't have photovoltaic panels that are, you know, inexpensive today. We wouldn't have all the wind turbines that have made massive amounts of wind energy uh, available. So it was wildly successful, but that was 1973, and now it's 2016. And, and in some ways, we don't have the luxury of time. Yes, we have to be patient, but at the same time, this is an urgent issue. And I wonder if, if, if either or both of you could make some remarks about yeah. what do we need to do differently today in this next round of, of investment in energy R&D that allows us to get there much more quickly? That's a great question. Um, I don't know. I had this very discussion with, uh, with Steve Chu. Uh, is, is he around? Steve, are you here? Uh, well, he and I had this discussion yesterday at the Tesla factory meeting. So let's look at how do we accelerate innovation and actually going down that learning curve much faster than what can be done today. And if you look at the historical context of what has gone faster and what has gone slowly, um, you find that you know, we have unbelievably gone faster in, for example, solar panels. We never could have expected the cost to come down so quickly, the efficiencies to go up that quickly. And the question is, why is it so? On the other hand, if you look at, you go back in history, um, the learning curve for nuclear was going the opposite way. The more we did, the more expensive it became, which is the wrong trend. So what is, that, what is it that makes it go faster this way? And it is about iteration in the system. If you make small modular systems uh, and get it in front of the customers um, and get it in front and deploy it, you can then learn from it and actually make it, you know, and you can iterate faster so you can innovate faster. It does not happen if you 
build a behemoth plant, and that's only one of its kind. And I think when you take that lesson and look at how our energy system is constructed today, let's say the chemical industry or petrochemical industry, they have huge plants today, right? And those were built 30, 40 years ago. And they're still in, I mean, look at our coal-fired power plants. And one has to think carefully, now that natural gas has come back and a lot of chemical industry is coming back, is that the way we want to go? Or do you want to build small modular systems, not just in nuclear, but many other areas, so you can iterate faster? And I think it's the, one of the biggest challenges, both on a technology point of view as well as in, in, the, in the engineering, the system design, is how do we get economies of scale in modular systems? And typically, people think that modular system, you don't get economies of scale. That's a real issue that we should be focusing on. And all of these technologies that I was talking about can, you know, uh, you could look at them and say that which ones are modular, which ones are not, and if they're not modular, how do we make them modular and iterate faster? Okay, terrific. Um, so would you like to answer, uh, give any remarks on that? Or I've got another question for you. I, let, me, let me try a very simple one on, on, in response to that. Um, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that when you try to solve this type of problem for the world, uh, it's so complicated, and I think one of the lessons as I've dissected through the last 10 years is everyone sort of acted alone in trying to solve their own problem and, and make things successful. The key is collaboration. I think this kind of a technological solution or innovative solution or creating a new future truly, truly, truly requires collaborative efforts. And, and I think that's where, you know, I, I'd say if you're the president and, and you're the White House, um, I mean, there's a lot of practicalities of what it takes to get things done, but the convening power of the White House is absolutely phenomenal. It's unparalleled. And I think recognizing that you can solve a global problem with that convening power, you can make a huge impact. And we've seen it. I mean, this president, this secretary, in the last year, there have been a number of things that have gone on at the White House where they have brought together philanthropists. They have brought together institutional investors. They have brought together other governments. I think these are excellent examples of what it can take to get things done. So whilst we can argue about they're not doing this or they're not doing that, I think let's focus on the positive, which is that convening power and trying to collaborate at a global scale to deal with a very complex global problem. So that's, that's really the only thing I can add to it. Let okay. me just double down on that because I think the, I completely agree, the convening power, the convening authority uses very little taxpayer dollars. But the impact of that is enormous for the taxpayer dollars, whatever little is used. And I think it, the bully pulpit of the president is a huge one and we need to leverage that as much as possible. Okay, we only have uh, about three minutes left, if I'm correct. So, uh, so the final question to you. So Governor Granholm um, made the case that if we want to encourage uh, the U.S. to rapidly adapt to, uh, you know, to, to pursue these things, that we need to make the case that um, this is going to create jobs, U.S. jobs. And if we look historically at um, the U.S. investment in R&D, many of the things that we've invented here end up creating a lot of manufacturing jobs overseas. Um, so if we think particularly about mission innovation, which the goal is to double the investment in R&D, if you couple that to a jobs agenda, how can we do this next you know, version of uh, R&D, energy R&D, to make U.S. jobs? What do we need to do differently? Well, let's step back for a moment and ask the question that, let's say you were to do wind farms, for example, um, and ask how can we create jobs out here? One has to recognize that these are, when things are made, manufactured, or even deployed, these are global supply chains. This is, happens in the private sector. It is, the government doesn't make things. Mm -hmm. It enables the private sector to make things. To recognizing that global supply chain, then you ask the question, how do, can we capture the value in that value chain out here including part of being is the, is the jobs part. Mm -hmm. 
I would love to see, I mean, I, what, what Governor uh, Granholm mentioned about, you know, this state and that state, I mean, I think that's terrific. I would love to see the federal government have the states compete. I think competition is a good thing. And have them compete, and if they have the natural resources or the ecosystem of universities and or other organizations, I think they will then, you know, they will come out in front and let then the private sector run through this in private-public partnerships, exactly what, uh, what Jagdeep was talking about. Let, let the collaborations happen in a self-assembled way, in a bottom-up way, and let them compete for any federal dollars, if there is, for looking at uh, these kinds of ecosystems. Okay, your thoughts? My thoughts. Okay, well, there are a lot of experts on jobs here, so I'm not going to touch that part. But related to jobs is the fact that I convened all our national labs at, at the UC system for a day in my office to learn about what could I do to help them with respect to funding innovation and commercialization of technology coming out. What shocked me is at the end of the day, what they reminded me of is the future recruitment of their own research scientists was dependent on the fact that they needed to change their culture to become more innovative and recognize that if they didn't show this next generation of leaders or scientists in this country that they were a lab that actually could take idea to reality and actually had a pathway and partnerships, it would limit their ability to attract the next best talent. And so we left thinking, whatever we do, if you're a leader today in any one of our UC organizations, we got to move towards a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship and a pathway and a partnership between the ideas into reality. And frankly, as I try to hire people in my office, the new millennials, they'd rather come work for people in organizations that actually think about sustainability, not just as a brochure, but inculcated into the culture of the organization. So I think, you know, if, you can, if this is a cultural change that's going on in the mind of our younger generation, and that generation is our next generation of leaders, I think you'll see more dramatic change in the way jobs get created and new types of organizations embracing this type of opportunity. So those are my final thoughts. Okay. All right. Well, please, let's thank the panelists. Thank you very much.